Ja, hallo, herzlich willkommen zum dritten Nachmittagstalk hier im Hörsaal 1. I need to switch to English now, so welcome everybody. Um, yeah, it's the third talk this afternoon um, here in uh, the uh, Audimax. Um, and uh, it's Derek Redhaus uh, from the UK, born in Netherlands. Uh, really did a lot of work in the internals of PHP, um, now works uh, for MongoDB as a senior engineer. I think you did the xDebug for the PHP, uh, contributed to OpenStreetMap. I'll just put on my slide and say... Yeah, okay, <laughs> so, you're, okay, so you, you can do it better than me. So um, he will tell a lot about the inner workings of PHP, so um, yeah, and... Uh, He said we are going to expect lots of wonkiness, a form of assembly, and trees. So thank you very much, Derek, right. please. Thanks for the introduction. The only thing he didn't mention that I like maps, beer, and whiskey. So there we go. Next slide. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to uh, look at a few things, a few different stages. Um, we're going to look at what the stages are, what conversion stages are, and conclusion is. The idea of this talk is to sort of let you know how many computer languages, although the examples are mostly in PHP, many computer languages go from a script source all the way to running things on a CPU. So we'll be going through the different stages that PHP does and see yeah, what, kind of, what, what, what is necessary to actually build up a language. And then we'll do, look at some other interesting techniques on looking at code as well. So let's, get, let's get have a look at what stages we actually have in running code. So the four stages, in, at least in PHP, uh, the first thing is parsing the script. The parsing the script um, also means converting code in, into tokens. What all those words mean, I'll get to in a moment. Um, second stage is we're going to have to create a logical representation of the code. Basically, that's where PHP looks at what the code is and makes something out of it, right? It needs to understand what the code says. So that's the second step here. Uh, from that, there on, we are creating executable code. Um, uh, we're converting this, this tree into code, uh, and then PHP executes this bytecode in something that is called the Zend engine. All right, so the first stage, the parsing stage, is the, the way how a parser works is it looks at what happens in your script basically line by line. And if it encounters specific keywords, it jumps to a different stage. So. A simple example, if you've ever written a PHP script in your life before, in PHP it is basically HTML, right? If you don't write a PHP tag, it just gets sent out straight to the browser. Um, most people don't do that anymore, but it's still something you can do. So the initial state of the parser in PHP is basically saying, well, echo things to the output. Um, then that is the initial state, how it is called. But there's a few others as well. Uh, the, the most important one is, is, for example, the moment you see a PHP starting tag, the parser switched to a different mode called ST and scripting. That, that is text for, well, we're currently parsing PHP code and no longer just putting things straight to the browser. Uh, but then even in, P, in, in the scripting state, there are different things sometimes. Things behave differently depending on which context you're in. So, for example, if you are in double quotes, variables get interpreted in a different way. So the parser needs to have a specific stage for knowing how to deal with behavior of parsing things within double quotes. And similarly, if you have now docs, which is like a longer form of a PHP scripts, there's going to be something similar in here. Now, any time, so the tokenization step is defined in a big file, which is Zend language scanner.l, stands for Alexa. Um, it basically defines all the tokens that, that it could find, and for each of those things have an action. So if you look at the very simple PHP open tag here, it's, it says only apply this if this is the initial state, because, of course, if you're already in scripting, we want to ignore the, the, the PHP open tag, because it makes no sense to do the tries, right? You get a parse error for that, actually. And it is then followed by a space, a tap, and a new line, all optionally. So what this basically says that, well, the PHP open tag is uh, the angle brackets, uh, question mark PHP, followed by a space, a tap, and a new line, um, which means the new line gets eaten, right? Nothing happens there. 
And when it does that, it needs to do something with the new line because PHP needs to know in which line of the code it is currently at, otherwise it can't throw correct errors. Just kind of handy to know. It switches to the different state by using this begin thing and then it returns the token. So for everything that it parses, every different element, it, uh, it then emits this token. But no meaning is given to this token. The scanner, the tokenization, only looks at the different keywords that are in here. And handily, PHP comes with a tokenized extension, so you can actually have a look of what the parser actually sees, or sorry, the scanner actually sees. So if we have this example script, uh, most of my examples will, ha will be related to a little whiskey app that I wrote called Dram.io, which you're more than happy to have a look at if you're into whiskey, or rum, or tequila, or any of the other spirits. Um, so yeah, my examples will be coming from there. So this is a really simple, useless script, right? It just do that, doesn't do anything. It defines a class in a namespace. And another particularly very interesting class at that. Um, so when a tokenizer goes over this, it, it, it changes this into all those tokens. So I've slightly edited the output that comes out of the tokenizer, and I've removed all the white space in it. Uh, otherwise, it looks really silly. Um, but the, the main constructs it picks out of here are the T open tag, you might, you might remember from two slides ago. And the value of that is the PHP opening tag. Then you get T namespace, which is the namespace keyword. Then we get some white space, we get T string, and then the word RAMIO. But as you see, it doesn't actually associate the string RAMIO directly with the namespace. It is just tokens that it sees, right? It sees in the namespace token, it sees a string, and the string has then a value called RAMIO. So it doesn't do anything more than that with us. Similarly, you get like the, the, the closing statement, uh, semicolon, you get white space, then you get the class keyword. You get then a string, which is called whiskey, or the value of string is whiskey. And not necessarily every token has a value. Uh, like T open tag doesn't have one, or T namespace doesn't have one, but T string does have one. Because of course, in, in the end, it needs to sort of know what the value of these strings are to do anything useful with it. Uh, similarly, you get T private for a private keyword, T public, um, T object operator, which is the error operator, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, there's about, well, what I remember, about maybe 100 tokens or so. And those are usually the names that you see when you uh, write some PHP code and there's a syntax error, it will tell you, oh, unexpected token, and then it gives you the name of the token and its value and if, you, if there is one. So that is what the parsing stage does. But as I said, this parsing stage doesn't do anything logically with the information it finds in the script. That is done by the scanner. So the scanner converts tokens or a collection of tokens into uh, something uh, called a, uh, in, into a structure that represents the logical information that is encoded in these tokens. And this is kind of complicated how, how this looks like. And uh, yeah, this is probably the most complicated part of PHP besides its ex executor. Basically, this is another state machine. It's a state machine that, stand, that starts with nothing. Uh, the nothing is in this case called the top statement. And the top statement is basically the first thing in a PHP script. Uh, there's no state in there, right? So what can you put in a PHP script? Well, you can put in a class definition or a function definition or trait declaration, or you can just put in standard code or statements, right? So those are the four options that you have here. And the way how this, the scanner rules written is that, well, the top statement is either a statement or a function declaration statement or a class declaration statement, or a trade declaration statement, and there's a whole bunch of others, but I've left those out because run out of space on the, on the, on the slide here. Now, just to have a quick look at what the class declaration says. So the class declaration, if you remember in PHP, they can have modifiers, so you can have an abstract class or a final class, and then you can have the class name, or you can just have the class name right from the start, right? The, the modifiers are optional in here. And that is basically what it says. So there are two options here. The, the pipeline tells you that it's an or. It's either this rule set or the other rule set. And the first one is, well, we have class modifiers and then the T class token. But then we need to check what are those class modifiers first, right? So that's what the scanner does. It then sees this other definition of that I've highlighted in, in pink here. And pink then says, well, the class modifiers, they are either going to be class modifier or they're going to be class mo modifiers followed by class modifier. And this is a way how 
traditionally scanners would resolve like uh, recursion and things. It, it doesn't define so you can have two class modifiers or three class modifiers because that'd be a silly thing to do. Because especially for statements, you never know how many you're going to have, right? So and then class modifier then checks that it's either T abstract or T final. And then it, with each of the rules it finds between the curly braces, it then associates an action with it. So for if it finds T abstract or T final, it basically sets the dollar dollar sets all the output of this action. We're setting it to either Zend ACC explicit abstract class. That is a flag internally that says, well, there's an abstract class. And you have the same thing for Zend ACC final, marking this as a final class. Once it has resolved this rule set, no, it then pops back to the original one, say we have an abstract class uh, whiskey. It then sees this T class token, and it does then do something with this class. The first thing it does, it basically assigns the current line number to an internal variable so that it can create uh, for PHP's reflection that can tell you between which lines a specific class is, for example. Uh, not the most interesting thing is this one. You then get the T string for the name of the class, and then it says extends from implements list backup doc document. It's a very long name. Basically what it says is, well, we can have uh, things that this class extends from, like inheritance, which is the extends from, which I didn't show on the slide. Then a class can also implement interfaces, which is the second thing. Then there's the backup document, is if a class has a specifically format comment on it, it will also do something with it and store that so that you can look at the comments later. And then from those rule sets, it then um, creates actions. So what it says here, in red, I've said Zend AST create declaration. And all those Zend AST calls that are actually being run as, as C code uh, later, they build up this tree of the logical interpretation of your script. And that's the next step that we have. So the scanner rules, they give meaning to the tokens. And from this, it constructs this AST through rules. And you have it for every different element that you have, for binary operations, uh, for assignment operations, for 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 loops, for if else loops, and so on and so on. Um, the scanner rules is something that we write in a file called Zend language scanner.y, and this is a file that that's converted into an enormous C file um, that has basically has a state a state number for every of the different aspects that make up this big rule set. Um, the class declaration statement ends up being case 167, 168, and there's, I think, between one and 2,000 of them. It's not a file you want to look at, and also you, one you don't have to look at because it's all auto-generated for you, unless you want to debug it, I guess. So the scanner rules convert this into this abstract syntax tree, and that is a really difficult word to say very quickly, so I'm going to call this an AST from now on. I've learned that from a previous time I gave this talk. All right, so what is this AST? <laughs> An AST describes the structure of, your, uh, of the parsed script. And each node is a language construct. And language construct can, you know, class definition, function definition, statement, and so on and so on. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. So nested structures are represented through this tree as well. So if you have a nested if statement, it will look nested in this AST. It also doesn't keep all of your original code and text. Like it strips out all the white space, it strips out all the comments that are not associated with a class or function, because they, those you can see back through a reflection, all as you can't. Um, and again, it is, there's a cool tool that actually can visualize this AST for you, uh, written by one of the other PHP core contributors. And uh, the original idea is that from this AST, we can actually run some optimizations, figure out which things can never, be, uh, can never happen, like if you have an if true, then you clearly know that one of the branches in this if-else statement can never happen because it's always going to be true and things like that. PHP itself doesn't do a lot of these optimizations, but because there's an AST in there, it allows it for other extensions like Zend Opcache to look at this AST and optimize that before it generates bytecode from it. Now, the reason why PHP itself doesn't do this a lot is because if you know that if PHP sees a script, every time it sees a script, it will parse it, create an AST out of and execute it. Doing optimizations on this stage is actually quite expensive to do, so it makes no sense to do it on every request. Of course, if you get a cache in there, like Zend opcache, then it can 
spend more time on doing this optimization on the first time. Uh, it, of course, that means doing this the first time takes more time. But all subsequent requests, because it has this cache in there, it doesn't have to do this anymore. So it has all the optimizations built in there, making it even faster. So this is the reason why PHP doesn't do this itself, but it's something that opcaches do. And this is just one of the things the opcache does though. So yeah, if you do the out, uh, if you do, if you call AST parse code on a script, you get like this very, very big long line. Like it's, it, I mean, it's very long. Well, of course, when I click now, it doesn't work, but let me see, scroll. It's a very, 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 very big, complicated thing to watch. So we don't do that. Luckily, it has a, uh, another method that actually allows you to formulate it for you, and that looks a lot easier already. So the start of your script is this AST statement list. STMT stands for statement. And then, it, well, it has a constant in it. I'm not sure what the constant is in this case, actually. I don't know what it, where it came from. But then you have AST class, which is then a class. And well, a class has different attributes, like I have the flags. It could be a, sta a static class, so no, an abstract class or a final class, for example. It has a name. It could implement other, uh, it could inherit from other classes. It doesn't do that, so that's why this set null. It can also implement interfaces. There's none either, so that's also null. And then you have the list of statements that belong to this class. And statements that belong to a class, well, they can be constant definitions, they can be property definitions, or of course, they can be methods, right? Um, so in this case, there is only two elements, two statements in a class, which is, well, first of all, we de define a private property. So it's a property declaration with the flags private, making it a private a property. It has a name, it has a name null, and it has no default value. Um, then we get a meta definition, and you probably can guess what the first one does. It's your constructor. So there's a public constructor. Uh, it has a list of arguments or parameters. In this case, as one. You can see that the type of it is no, like no type, not, no type in is defined for it. It has a name, name, and a default value, no. Um, then uh, for each method, after the parameter declaration, you get all the statements that belong to this, and so on and so on. If you have this AST, you can basically rewrite back your original script, except that you probably lose all your new lines, because PHP doesn't necessarily care for those when having to execute code. Uh, for some reason, it actually does store that, but I'm not sure why the um, AST extension doesn't show that information, but it should be there, uh, because it is necessary to create errors out of at some point. Um, so yeah, that's a, a, a part of it, and of course, this goes on a little bit further. but. I won't be showing you this. Um, so yeah, to, to link that back to how this, where this comes from in the, in the AST itself, yeah, just making sure the colors are right, is that, well, different parts that made up my little constructor, I link them back to the different elements from the first method declaration, right? And the only one I really want to look at here is the this name assignment, assigning that to name. So the first statement and the only statement in this method is where we assign the value of name to the property this name. Right? So that is the, the name property of the class. So that is an assignment operation, which is the purple link, which is the assignment operator you have in there. And an assignment operator has two sides. It has a variable on the left-hand side and an expression on the right-hand side. The variable is not a simple variable. It is a more complicated variable because this is a property. Hence, it uses a C prop instead of uh, AST var. A property consists of two things. is an expression on the right-hand side, which is the name of your property in most cases. Sorry, the name of the left-hand side is your variable name, in this case, this. And then the property is name. So this little block says we assign a value of name to this name, and then we do that. All right, so the AST. Now, the AST is still something that PHP cannot execute because it needs to be converted to something that the Zend executor can run. And that is something that in PHP we call bytecode. So bytecode, we also call them opcodes. We call them two different ways to make it easier. Uh, not quite. <laughs> each function, each method, and each main body of the script is represented by something we call an op array. And an op array is basically a list of opcodes. It's a linear list of opcodes. So from this ASD, we need to convert all of the methods, all of the functions, to this array of opcodes. And the Zend engine will return, will execute each of those opcodes in turn, 
unless it sees a function call, then calls the function, starts executing the operate belonging to that functional method, and at the end it returns back to the previous function and starts executing that. You sort of expect that to happen, right? Um, it is very similar to assembly instructions if you've ever seen that the language is clearly not the same, but the concept of assembly instructions, uh, comparing that to PHP opcode, is very, very similar. Um, and there's a tool that you can use for visualizing that. This is a few different tools, actually. There's one in Opcache, there's one in PHP DBG, and there's a tool that I've written 15 or years ago called VLD that also allows you to, to have a look at this. So because I know this tool better, I'll be using that. All right, so to convert this little bit of ASD that I have in the start, it's this, what was it, my constructor. It was a very, very simple constructor which we're converting into opcodes. And in this case, it ended up being seven opcodes, right? Number zero to six. The first one is called XNOP. NOP stands for no operator. That doesn't basically do anything anymore. Uh, it, it is basically a placeholder for uh, function underscore underscore construct. But that you don't have to associate any code with it, but it still ends up being in there. Uh, why that is exactly, I don't know. There's lots of things like, why is this like this? I don't know, because it's PHP. So I said, there's lots of interesting and really complicated things in there. So every opcode has two operands and a return value. So we see that, or, or up to two operands and a return value. The first opcode, besides the noop, is called RECV, stands for receive basically tells me, well, we're going to accept an argument that's being pushed on the stack into the function. In this case, we're receiving an argument, and the name of this argument, the value of this argument, we're going to put in a variable called exclamation mark zero. Now, PHP doesn't have exclamation mark syntaxes for vari variables, as you know, but it's internal speak for a compiled variable. So this is a placeholder number for, and you can look that up slightly higher, it tells you that is the name variable. So it's just a quick substitution that is an optimization so the peep doesn't have to look up where to find a variable every time it sees the name of a variable. It's a faster thing that came in PHP 5.3. Then you get X statement. X statement doesn't do anything, but it's great for debuggers because this is the point where they can hook in for uh, pa pausing the debugger. That is what X statement is for. And if you do not have a debugger loaded, that opcode will actually not be there. PHP doesn't generate it for you. Um, and then you get the assignment operator. What did I say, right? I said every uh, opcode has, at most, a return value and two operands. But that's not true either. It's true most of the time, but it's PHP. So, and the, the, the first example is here, which is a curious one, because if you look at the operands, there's only one operand listed but there's actually two. There's two, except one is silent, because as PHP has lots of shortcuts in it to make things go faster, as you expect. So the assign obj opcode assigns a property of a specific variable and assigns a value to that. For that, it needs uh, three operands, right? It needs the name of the variable, the name of your property, and then the value. So that is actually, it needs three, three bits of information to do so. But as I said, at the max, you can only have two. But the this is a shortcut, so you only have one in there. So you have this one, one variable, and this is implied here. But it still needs to have the value, and that is because that is the normal case. It, it attaches a secondary opcode to this called opdata, which is in some cases like this one, used for giving you the third operand in this case, the name of the variable. So those two lines basically say, well, we're assigning the value of the exclamation mark zero, which is name, of, uh, name variable, to the name property on the this object, on the this object. Then it has an old X statement because you can pause afterwards, and then it does a return null. Every single function and method in PHP always has a return statement at the end. If you don't set it yourself, there will be a return null. If you do set it yourself, uh, the return null is no longer there, although early versions of PHP 5, it actually wasn't removed. Is this clear? Because it's kind of complicated. I know it's a very small example. They will get more, more, they will get more difficult. We need to start small. 
So now let's have a look at jumps. Um, I've seen people do this on this rock, it's crazy. It's also about 700 meters off the ground, but you can't quite see that. All right, so let's, let's have a look at the if statement. So the if, although it is not a loop, it is a very simple language construct, and this is where the go-to sort of come in. As I've said, that opcodes are executed one by one in order in a linear line. So if you want to do loops in that, you need to sort of have a way to skip things and go back to things if you have a for loop, for example. But the if statement is very simple. You either ex execute the code, the statements inside the match, or you don't. Right? That's basically what it is. So in this case, well, we're comparing the value A to 42, and if that's true, we are going to live universe and everything. Now, to see this in AST, it looks like follows. Well, you have the AST if, which is your language construct. Well, and that has uh, multiple possibilities, right? It is, the comparison in this case is a binary operation. You compare a, value to, a variable to a value. It has two bits of it. It has a left side and a right side. The left side is your variable name on the left side of the binary operator. And on the right hand side, you have a constant value, which is 42. And the flags for binary operation is, is equal. They can also be greater than or less than or not equal and extra equal and stuff like that, right? Or equivalent, I think, is the right word for the three uh, equal signs. And then if this matches, then there is a list of statements that it can execute. And the statements in this case is my echo statement, which is to live the universe and everything. Now, because this is something that is being conditionally executed, there needs to be a way to skip parts of it, right? So and if you look at the opcodes, that is something you see back. So in this case, we have six opcodes. The X statement at the start, um, again, is there so that debuggers can stop. But the first important thing is the is equal operand, which compares a variable with a expression. So the variable in this case is the dollar exclamation, sorry, the exclamation mark zero again. And the value or the expression is the constant value 42. So that's a very simple one. And what this equal does is compare those values and then re returns the result of this expression into uh, the tilde one temporary variable. So this is not a variable that persists for more than one or two statements, or rather for more than one or two opcodes actually. And then the next opcode says jump z, and the z stands for zero. Basically, this looks at a return of the previous operation, and if it is false or zero, then it will jump to the opcode that is specified in the second operand. So this says basically, if the res result of a equals 42 is false, we're going to jump to opcode number five. And that is what this little thing here indicates. So in other words, if the if case doesn't match, we jump over the case so that we don't do the uh, echo to live winners and everything. Right, this makes sense, right? But it's also a lie because in PHP 7.1, the is equal and the jumps are contracted into one operation. Uh, but for the logic of it, this is basically how it works. Uh, yeah, lots of shortcuts to make things go faster, but it works, so why not continue doing it? So yeah, it's a, it's a construction, but the opcodes are still there. They had not been converted into a specialist opcode because that uh, would, first of all, break a code like this that looks at where all the jumps are because it needs to be able to determine uh, for later, for like, figure out where you can have code that you don't have anymore, can be executed to uh, then being optimized out and stuff like that. So it is not something that can just be removed from here. Um, but it is shortcutted, and not every case either, but most of them. And then at the end, we have the return one, which I don't know where that came from. All right, so an if can, of course, also have an else statement, right? And in this case, the if is now a statement list, and if have then, for each of those cases, it has this if alum construct. So if alum with a value is an expression that compares a to, to in this case, pi, and then the second if alum element does not have a condition at all because it's just your L, so it always gets executed if it hits that far. And then it echoes squares. Now if you look at the opcodes again, there's more jumps in there now. The, the first comparison and the jump Z you have seen before. Right, that is just your normal if statement. But of course at the end of the first echo, 
after echo circles, you want to make sure it doesn't ac also execute echo squares. So there needs to be a jump that jumps out of it. So at the, the last step of the statements in the first block of the if statement, there's now a jump instruction, GMP, that jumps straight to number eight. So GMP is an unconditional jump. And well, jumps basically are our go-tos. Right? There's nothing else about it. They're a bit more clever because they're sometimes conditional depending on which jump you have, but in the end, they're go-tos. And that's going to echo squares. Let's have a look at loops or rings. Anybody wants to guess where this is? Nobody? Everybody asleep? Four loops, yes. Well, I was specifically referring to this big ring. Be between the border of France and Switzerland, it's a very big ring. No? Yeah, there you go, it's CERN. All right, so yeah, the for loop. The for loop is the first loop that we're looking at. And if you look at a for loop, it has multiple parts, right? It has your initial uh, assignment, it has a condition, it has a end of loop operation, list of operations to run, and it has all the statements in there. And those are the four things that come back if you look at the AST4 um, uh, construct in, in the AST. So if the initialization step, which is a list of expressions, remember you can use a comma and stuff in there. Um, you have the condition, which can also be multiple conditions in there, and then you have the, the loop, which is the thing that gets executed at the end. Now if you look at how the opcodes get arranged for this, you see it gets a bit out of order, right? Because if you look at the first number, the line number, you do first a bit of number two, then a bit of number four, then a bit of number two again. Uh, which is kind of weird. But if you think about it, you can rewrite for loops with go-to statements. Now you should never do this in, in any code you write, but you can do this. <laughs> So if we do that, it becomes a lot more clear to how the opcodes actually relate to this. So if we rewrite our for loop to the initial condition, go to the condition, if the condition matches, then we're going to execute our statement, right? And then the end of the list of statements, it does the blue operator for the end of loop increment. And if you rearrange it like this, then it is a one-to-one -one match with the opcodes that you get out of it again. And then it becomes a lot clearer. So the for loop has this. Uh, yeah, don't ever write code like this yourself, as I said. Anything else interesting in here? Nope. All right, so the while loop, a similar thing, right? You have an initial, or rather you can rewrite a for loop as a while loop as well if you want to do that really. So you have your initial statement, you have the while keywords, uh, you have then your condition, and then you have the statements in there, and then you can do an end of loop instruction, yeah. which in this case we haven't done because it's been put in a while case. So here we have while we do the assignment, we do the, we do the jump immediately because um, it jumps to opcode six to do, the, um, to do the condition. And if the condition matches, it then jumps back to opcode four to do, the, to do the echo itself. If not, if the jump not Z instruction doesn't match, like if the previous one uh, was false in this case, then it will just drop down without having to jump. So by rearranging those opcodes, it makes it a little bit cleverer because less jumps are, uh, are necessary, uh, speeding things up again. Do well, a very similar thing, just slightly reorganized. I won't go spend too much time on this slide. For each gets more complicated. For each loop is, um, for each in PHP loops over elements in an array or elements in an expression really. And in order to do that, it needs to keep track internally of where it is in the array. So it has an extra pointer or cursor that loops through the array. And any time you do a for each loop, PHP allocates this cursor object. And it does that through an opcode called fe reset r. So it allocates this cursor object, also sets it back to the start of the string. Um, the result of this is your, um, see this correctly, is, um, well, it, it looks at the array, and if, if the array is empty, then it will not even do this and just jump straight over the loop. Again, this is a shortcut. So the FE reset R with the exclamation mark zero and the jump to 11 basically says if the array is empty, we just jump straight out of it and don't do it bother doing anything, which is great. So inside every loop, it needs to fetch information, right? It needs to fetch your key and your value. So that's the first thing that, that happens here. Fetch R 
fetches the value into the uh, value uh, into the it fetches the value into the val value variable. That's a tricky one to say as well. Uh, again, if and then advances the cursor, and it, if it knows if if it can't advance, it will also jump out of the loop. Then you have the assignment. The, the assignment that is opcode five is there for assigning the key. Uh, because if, if we don't do the key to error value, that opcode is simply missing because it is not necessary. Now, what again did I say about how many operands an opcode had? It was two, wasn't it? Look at the one on opcode number three. How many operands does that have? It has three of them. Um, yeah, sometimes PHP does that. It has this extended value that, is some, that, that often only encodes a jump instruction. That's the only thing it does. Well, with an exception here and there. Because PHP, right? <laughs> what can I say? So what is important, uh, one more thing I want to point out here is that because for, a, for each loop, it needs to uh, allocate this cursor object and it needs to free it at the end, which is, you see, with the FE free in, in line 11. This is one of the reasons why when PHP actually got to go to keywords, which, by the way, you should use a bit restraint, um, you cannot actually jump into loops because of this reason. Because if you jump straight into, line, say, line seven, then it wasn't, it, the curse wasn't, wasn't, how do you say that, um, allocated, right? So if you would then jump to the thing where it needs to fetch something from the cursor, it wasn't there, and that you can't do certain so crashes. So this is one of the, why one of the restrictions and go-tos in PHP doesn't allow you to jump inside of constructs, but only jump out of them. Again, please don't use that. And then you get to really complex loops where you have multiple nested levels. Uh, it's, it tends up being something like this sometimes, if you really look. Any of you seen Primer? No? Don't watch it just once, because you won't understand the film. OK, so the really complex loops, let, let me visualize those with a tool, because that makes it a lot easier to, to see. I'll, I'll sort of skip on the, um, the opcodes here because you can have a look at them yourself later. I'll put the slides online. And you can actually see in the, tr in the tree structure here what actually gets constructed from the opcodes that are being there. And they're very similar to what you would expect, right? Like in line two and three, it does do some initialization. It sets the, the value of the array. Then you have the for each in, uh, I've got my laser point here. In line three, you have like, matching this line, so there's a decision to be made, right? Either the array is empty or the array is not empty. And if the array is empty, we jump straight out of it. We jump to opcodes 12 and 13 on line eight, which is, I believe, this one here. So we jump straight out of the loop. And that is what the, the arrow points out here, right? If the, if the array is empty, we jump straight out of it and then we leave the function. Now, if the array isn't empty, well, we have the first if statement. And the first if statement, you can either go left, it's true, or right, it's false. If it is, true, if it is false in this case, you get another if statement, in which case it can be true or false. So the, the arrays or the, the graph splits once more into it, right? Anytime you have a conditional, you get an extra split in your graph. And then, of course, they can loop back because of for each loop, of course, loops over your whole array, so it goes back to fetching another value if there's another one. So yeah, this graph, which is actually part of VLD, the tool can actually create those graphs for you. That's how I create my slides, because I can't draw those things myself. Right? I'm, I'm a lazy programmer. I write tools to do the drawing for me. And then we get exceptions, which are also really difficult. Um, exceptions are called in order. So if, you, if the exception doesn't hit, hit um, it catches it. And if the catch doesn't match, it will look for the next catch. If that doesn't match, it will look for the next catch. And if there's none there, it will bubble up the exception. So the actually, if you look at this, you sort of realize that if you have exception classes that are called way more often than others, you should put them at, uh, sort of have to put them at the start because that makes it a bit quicker. In a similar way, if you do this with, um, with switch case statement, which I don't think I have a slide for, it's a similar thing, right? If, Almost every single time, the value that you're matching against in your switch, you should put at the, at the start. 
because that is the first condition that PHP will check for you. And then the second one, and the third one, and so on and so on. This is something that's going to be addressed in PHP 7.2, where if all the values in your case statements are either all numbers or all strings, you actually create a hash map for that, shortcutting the whole thing, so it doesn't have to check every single statement. Again, making it faster again. So many little tricks. Okay, so what can we do? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Damn it. I was hoping to skip. Fast call is really complicated. If I have time about it, I will try to explain it. Okay, is that good? Yeah, so the dead code thing. I mean, sometimes you write code that can never be executed, right? Things that you do after return statements. So if you have this very simple thing, like you have echo 40, return, and then echo 2, clearly the 2 is never going to be executed because we have just returned from the function. So there's some code. Um, in both VLD as well as an XDebug that makes heavenly use of the code analysis parts in VLD. Uh, it actually figures out which, which lines of code, or which operands or which opcodes cannot be executed. And it marks those with a little star after the operand number. So you can see that opcode 4, the echo 2, is marked with this little star because it can never be executed. Which is useful to have. Because optimizers can use this to get rid of them to make your code smaller. All right. I have five, well, I have 20 minutes, but five minutes to hope finish the presentation. Um, so why is this useful to have a look at analysis of where the, uh, what the paths are in? Well, a common thing to do if, right, if you write test cases is figuring out what your code coverage of your functions are, right? So if we have this function if then else, uh, we have two unrelated if statements in there. We have the first if A equals true, and the second if B equals true. I can make sure that my test case covers all of the lines in this function, but just issuing two calls, right? I can pass in where A is true and B is false, or where A is false and B is true. And I've covered every single line in the code, but you haven't tested all of the parts in your code yet, because you haven't tested where both A, are, both a and B are true, or where A and B are false. Now, several years ago, the developer of PHP Unit says, well, we need to fix this, and you write some code for that, Derek. So I did. It took me about a year and a half to do, because it's complicated. I got busy with life. That happens. Um, but I did actually get it into XDebug 2.4. Well, there's two problems with this. It is very difficult to visualize, which I'll explain to you in a moment. Also, it's ridiculously slow. And I'll also explain what that is. So um, if you run this with, uh, with code coverage, if you set this up yourself, uh, you do those two lines. I'll skip over that as well. It, it looks ba better if I show you the output of it, and you can see all, all six lines are green, right, because I've managed to hit all the lines in the code. But that's a lie. Uh, so XDebug 2.4 has a new, new flag for code coverage called CC branch check, which is a new magic sauce, uh, which adds extra analysis of doing the spot and branch uh, coverage. This is really slow to do, because it needs to figure out which branches there are, and then which paths you have through making use of all of these branches. Um, also, every time you have a conditional statement, you duplicate the number of paths that you have. So it's an exponential growth, right? And that is not a great, uh, well, computer science thing to have, really. <laughs> so what happens here with just the two if statements, you end up having five branches, the one before the if statements, a branch on each side for each of the if statements, right? And then you have four possible paths to go through there. They'll have the initial bit, and then you can go left or right. Uh, so you can either jump to opcode five, which is inside the if, or eight, which is outside of it, and on, so on, and so on. So what XDebug actually figured out for you here is that which branches are being hit, which is all of them, and which paths are being hit, which as you can see here, is only the two out of four. And as a tricky, t yes. It is, this output format is something that um, comes out of XDebug with a little contributor script that is in the contrib directory of XDebug. Okay, so it's PHP specific. This is PHP specific, yes. Yeah. So to visualize this, well, we can do this in the following area, right? right? For the, if you look at the graphs from previous one, well, what we can do for every part that is being hit, we draw a solid line, and for every part that has not been hit, we draw a dotted line. And, well, let's use a different color for each of the possible parts. And if you have 
Well, the four parts here, that is quite easy to do. Well, consider you have eight if statements in there. How many parts are you going to have then? You have 256, right? That makes a really, really wide graph. Also, can you really distinguish 256 different colors with your eyes? 256 you might manage, but if you get 1,024, you're kind of screwed, right? You just can't do that anymore. It's just too much of it. So somebody needs to write something clever to visualize this better, and I don't do that kind of stuff. So the balls back in, in Sebastian's court, who the developer of uh, PHP Code Covered, and he has now spent a year and a half trying to figure out how to do that. So this hasn't come anywhere yet. So we're going to do a quick recap to go over uh, quickly over the things that we talked about. Now we have some time for more questions. So we looked at the different stages that we have. We had first had a code, the, the script itself, written in ASCII. Well, not quite, uh, UTF-8 really. We converted to the tokens. The tokens are the, the blocks that make up every single part of the script. The tokens get converted by parsing state into this AST, this abstract syntax tree, which then gets converted to a bytecode, which then gets executed. We have looked at most of the jump structures here. And all tends to be, uh, all the looping structures, they end up being converted into this linear array of opcodes with jumps in it. We've done some code analysis for fun and profit to figure out which things can we remove from our code once we store it in our cache, of course. I mean, if you're just going to execute it and then throw it away, then why bother removing it in the first place? Because you're going to throw it away anyway. Um, there's no profit in this, just lots of fun. Um, <laughs> we have looked at a few tools. We have looked at PHP Tokenizer, which shows you all the tokens. We have looked at Nikita's AST extension to visualize the ASTs. We have had a look at VLD that shows you the graphs for the bytecode, and there we have looked at some code coverage. All right, that was pretty much what I had to talk about. Are there any questions? The fast call goes last. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, and I'll repeat the questions for the rest of you. I'm not actually very familiar with PHP, so I'm wrong, I always didn't get this really right, but uh, the scanner, it looked like it, the scanner already knows about some semantics of the object orientation system in PHP. Is that true? Like, does it? The scanner will do. Class, like mechanics? The, the scanner will know a little bit, right? Because, sorry, <laughs> I said I was going to repeat the question, and then, and then I didn't. Uh, the, to recap, the question is, does the scanner already know something about the OO semantics? And yes, the scanner in PHP does know some things about it. First of all, it knows that methods can be public, private, and protected, right? So that's one thing it needs to know that it is there. And similarly, it needs to know that um, how the inheritance works, because it will not allow you to actually inherit from, uh, yeah, you can't do multiple inheritance in PHP, so it, it has rules built in for that. It also knows, for example, that if a class has already been loaded, being parsed before, uh, and you parse a, um, something that implements this interface, then it, it already knows that because it was, the interface is already there. If, you then, if the class doesn't implement the interfaces, it also knows that at that moment, and it will show you an error. So in many cases, it knows something about previous scripts or class or interface that's already been loaded, but not always. And if it doesn't know that, it will resolve these things at runtime right. later. Yeah, and Pete. You. Yeah, you're most welcome. Okay, anything else? Yeah, go. Cool. Yes. So that the, I didn't hear the last last bit. All right, so that's a bit longer question for me to repeat. So in short, how does PHP know that there is a next catch statement? Come? Well, if the echo for the first echo statement would have been a throw, because this happens in the same function, that's easy enough, right? You can easily see that it would be catch come because um, it just follows down the, the line to see where the first catch is. If it is a function call that throws the exception, 
then the moment you do an exception in a function call, the function aborts. And the execution gets passed back to where it was called from. And then PHP can find the first catch statement. Um, I actually believe that PHP internally already knows on which uh, op lines there's a catch statement. So it shortcuts that a little bit sometimes. Um, but in most cases, it just goes down until it finds the first catch statement. Um, if it doesn't find it, then it, it knows already where the next one is. So something I didn't quite explain. So the scanner actually runs twice, sort of. There's like two stages in. In the first stage, it doesn't know about these things. But on the second stage, it figures out where all those catch statements are and can from that build up a list of the linking of the catch statements as well as the case statements. So that happens in like a, it is not a full pass of the scanner, but it's something additional that it does as a sort of second stage kind of thing. Yeah, one more. Because it also knows between which lines they're trying catch statements. It, that is true. That does not show up in the opcodes, but it shows up in the meta information associated with each operate, which VLD cannot visualize, so it doesn't tell you. Which would be nice if it could do that, but it doesn't at all. All right, anything else? Oh. You, go first. you can go first. Uh, you mentioned that uh, opcache is able to uh, optimize the, the opcodes. Do you have uh, some examples of what kind of optimizations it does? Uh, it rem the, the optimization that the opcache does, basically what the question was. It uh, removes that code if it can. It will also sometimes reorganize things if you have like, um, it, it will convert post increment to pre increment, that kind of stuff. It's a bit of a useless operation to convert because speed in PHP isn't much of a difference. Uh, it will reorganize this. It will also, uh, if it can, contract jump instructions because in some cases the Output of the output of the AST two byte code conversion, it does two jump instructions right after each other sometimes, um, and it then will optimize it out if it can. Uh, that's one of the things it does. There's a whole bunch of others, but I can't quite remember what they do. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It doesn't do very complex things. Although I say that every version of PHP, they're becoming more and more complex, which makes it harder to explain. Right? Okay, yes. I hope you don't consider this as mic shedding. Is there <laughs> a reason why the opcode statement names and the um, token names are abbreviated all the time? I mean, why can't it say fast return instead of fast read? I assume it's return. Yeah, it does mean return. So the question is why are the tokens and opcode names abbreviated? No, or is there a reason? Is there a reason? There is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't. If I would do this now, if, that probably wouldn't happen. So it is historical reasons. Um, yeah, because J and P can be jumps at, right? There, it, it, there's no space requirement associated with any of them because they're basically constant values. And there's also, it would be quite easy to do is change VLD to write out the name of the opcode. There's nothing, nothing special about them. And it's the same with the name of the tokens. It's, Tokens are a bit different because the names are already defined in, in the lexer, so they're sort of more hard-coded, and I can't really do anything out of that without defining the whole list myself. But for the opcodes, you need to do that anyway. So yeah, there's, no, there's also no reason why, uh, in some cases, I actually have prefixed them with zent underscore. Don't know why, that, why I've done that either. Whereas in PHP itself, they're all prefixed with zent underscore. Also, I don't know why. All right, anything else? Yeah, one more. I noticed that the strings seem, I think, URL encoded. Yeah, yeah the, the strings are URL encoded only because of VLD. Okay. I need to make sure there's no knee lines in it to mess up my layout. So that's just a, No, 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 no. And PHP itself does not URL encode every single string. That'd be silly. All right. Yeah? So are there uh, linters built on the uh, PHP HD? Uh, are there linters built on top of the PAC? PHP AST, yes, there are. There's a tool called FAN, which stands for, it's P-H-A-N, 
because uh, why not? Uh, it's written, uh, I think, by Rasmus at Etsy, actually, that they wrote that uh, to figure out whether they can move their PHP 5 code to PHP 7, because fan can also read PHP 5 code, and then again can see whether behavior would have changed converting us from PHP 5 to PHP 7. So that just do some static analysis of these things. And um, I believe some other things are built on top of that. I also believe that, it's, that sh it should be possible to use the AST to enforce some style requirements. You, you can't do s syntax uh, things in that, right? Because the syntax being stripped out. But other things like um, every class must have a constructor kind of thing, that kind of things you can enforce by looking at the AST and stuff like that. Or names of variables, of course, you can do as well. So yeah, there, there are tools available, and fan from Etsy is, is a good one to have a look at, which is open source. It's, I think it's Etsy slash fan. Right. Anything else? You want your fast call uh, question? OK, <laughs> that's fine. Nothing on this side? All right, I have one more slide. which is my last slide that has a QR code that goes to a link to the slides. They are not up there. They will probably have to wait until Monday. Um, if you go to the URL, you can not only find the slides, you can also find a list of resources, some of the tools I spoke about, uh, some links to more information about PHP internals. There's a great article there um, written by Nikita about PHP 7 virtual machine. It really, really good article. If you have any questions, um, Feel free to email me. I, I hope to answer your questions in a reasonable time frame. I can't do any promises there. Um, if that's everything, thanks very much. I hope you learned something and enjoy the rest of the conference.